<laughs> All right, our, our lesson today is creating a tipping point. Now, I was inspired about thinking about this tipping point because last week, Linda mentioned the 100 monkey effect. And the 100 monkey effect is basically, it's, it's a hypothetical phenomena in which a new behavior or idea is spread rapidly by unexplained forces from one group to another. And the story comes from the scientists on Koshima Island um, in Japan were just in 1952, and they were just watching these monkeys. And this one baby girl monkey, they, they ate sweet potatoes. And this baby girl monkey gets a sweet potato and she rinses the sand off of it by putting it in the water. Well, her little playmates, they just kind of start doing what she's doing. And they, they, they had to actually teach their mamas to clean the sweet potatoes, right? The mamas didn't just pick up on it. They were taught how to do it. But then something interesting happened. By 1958, all the monkeys were rinsing their potatoes. But the weird thing was that the monkeys on some of the other islands were rinsing their potatoes too. And so this, when I heard, this was actually the first time I heard of something called the tipping point was when I learned the story of the 100 monkey effect from my chiropractor, where I used to work as a massage therapist like 10 years ago, or 15 years ago or something. But it was just kind of interesting, tipping point. Like when we all start doing something, like, you know, there was a tipping point when cell phones were invented. And at first, like, cell phones, they came in a little suitcase, and only, only the presidents of companies or corporations had a cell phone, because they were just that important. And I was like, I mean, at the time, I was like, well, I'm not important enough for a cell phone, so, you know, but then all of a sudden, it's like now everybody has a cell phone. And even, I know even some folks who are kicking and screaming about cell phones, it's like now I see them on there playing Bejeweled and stuff, right? <laughs> so cell phones, there was a tipping point and then all of a sudden it was just kind of a normal thing to have a cell phone. Now I was thinking about like what kind of tipping points in history or even ancient history? And what about when Moses brought the Hebrews the Ten Commandments, right? This, the Ten Commandments were new rules for living and it, it taught them how to live in peace and harmony with each other, but also it taught them how to have a relationship with this God, Yahweh, that seems so distant to them, right? And so it taught them to have this relationship. And then there was a movement, all right? And so now the Ten Commandments are widely accepted, like even all throughout Christianity. So we have Judaism and Christianity that accept the Ten Commandments. Um, and then you have teacher Yahshua, um, he came along and he said that he didn't fulfill, that he didn't come to fulfill the Ten, or he came to fulfill the Ten Commandments and also bring the greatest commandment, which was to love each other as he loved others. But he also was teaching how now this, this, this God, the Father, wasn't out there. He was teaching us how to have a relationship with the Spirit within. When he said, all these miracles I do, it's not I that does them. It's the Father within. So he was teaching something unheard of in that day. But like for us, we're just like, well, yeah, he said that. He said that. We don't even, we're just like, whatever. He said that. That's not weird. Okay, so that's another kind of a tipping point. He created, he created a movement, which is now accepted by millions and millions of people. Now, one of the other things we learned during Yahshua's lifetime and I say Yahshua because there was no letter J in the Hebrew alphabet. And he wasn't born baby Jesus. His mom actually named him Yahshua. And so Jesus is a new thing. So, But we're, we're going by Yahshua here. Um, he also taught that it's God's will for us to live a life abundantly. That is God's will for us. He said that he came not just so we would have life, but so that we would have it abundantly. All right, so that's God's will for us. Living a life abundantly is not about stuff, though. It's not about just collecting things or money. It's about calling forth that power that created worlds, calling it forth through us and out into our lives. Now, we use this power, and as, as we call forth this power of good to create good in our lives, well, then that keeps going out into the world. And so in our own way, each of us are a little tipping point in our little life, in the package of our life, we have the opportunity to create a tipping point also. So your mere presence on this planet is a gift. 
And it's not only is it a gift to you, but it is a gift being given through you. You are the means for which source gets to do its work in the world, right? Because you're the activity of God in this world. Without you, if you were not here, not only would there just be a sad little empty seat where you're not, but there would also be a complete lack of effects of good that you've done all your live long life. In your life, you have done good, and you might have thought you were just doing a normal thing, but somebody else took that good and they ran with it. Right? And you don't even know about all this good. You don't even know about this wave that came from your act of kindness somewhere. So all of those, all those effects would just be gone. All that good would just be gone. So one of the greatest things that we can experience is having the understanding of who we are. We are the emanation of spirit. We are the activity of God in a body. Where we come from, which is divine source energy, and also to understand that what we do matters. Everything we do matters. So to have this awareness actually changes our lives because when we have this awareness, we live our life differently. We make choices that honor the good that works through us. We live our lives in the truth that everywhere we stand is sacred ground. And all of our choices and actions honor the sacredness of all of life. Without this awareness, we don't make those same choices. Instead, we're choosing from fear and we'll gather together our excuses and our justifications and our limitations and we'll live life from there because we don't know who we are. We've forgotten. So it is important for us to understand that this power that creates worlds, it created us, but it continues to create through us continues to create. So we really have a good deal of power and influence in our lives. But without awareness, it may not be goodness and light that we're sharing with everybody. <laughs> One of my friends likes to say, we are either a shining example or a horrible warning. And that all just depends on what kind of awareness. Are we in awareness of who we are and where we come from? Or are we just in the dark about all that? All right, so through our lack of awareness, or having awareness that's always going to lead to our next set of choices and then the next set of actions that we take. So while we're in this awareness, of course, we're spilling out our gifts and we're spreading the good stuff everywhere. So we are here actually because we're here to live life abundantly. We are here to create some kind of a tipping point in our own life. And that's actually what the idea of creating heaven on earth is all about. As we're creating heaven on earth in our own life, people see this. Like, have you ever just looked at how somebody was living their life and they're happy and they are doing things they love doing? It's like, what are they doing in their life? What's different about them, right? And so this is how we serve as an example. When we're creating heaven on earth in our own life, we get to be an example and people get to see this. And of course, we learn by example better than we learn by words. <laughs> we just do. So we can do this individually, of course, and create little ripples, or we can all get together on this. And when we're all doing this together, like if all of us walk out of here today and we're like, okay, I'm gonna remember this, God is all things, and that mean, means me. Like if we all can do this all day to day, we just created a wave together instead of individual little ripples in our life. But for us to be a part of this movement to create heaven on earth, guess where the tipping point has to actually start, right? and our way of thinking, and our mind. We have a habitual way of thinking, and, and there's some science here. With a habitual way of thinking, what happens is our, our neural pathways, our neurons create little neural pathways, and then we have a habit, and we just our, our neurons just keep firing and wiring through that neural pathway. And so I think of it like, we used to have these two dogs. We lived in this house with this big backyard, and when we moved in, the yard was okay, but our dogs destroyed it. But they also ran around the perimeter constantly. And, and these dogs had like a rut. Like you'd think somebody was back there riding a dirt bike all the time. But it was our dogs did it. And we only lived there for a year or two. Okay? But that's what's happening. You could think of that 
Like if we have a way of acting in this life, a way of behaving, we're on autopilot all the time, it's because we're in a rut. We're in one of those ruts in our brain. Okay, so when we want to create a tipping point or create some kind of change in our life or take in a new set of ideas and beliefs, right? Like, like God is all things and that means me. We actually have to work at this for a minimum of 66 days, right? And it could be up to 122 days before you start thinking, oh, this, this might be working. It might actually take 122 days. Now, this is why we so often give up on stuff. Because you know how we're taught, personal growth circles, it's like 21 days to change a new habit. 21 days, just 21 days and you'll be a brand new you, right? But that I'm a 122 day person, okay? 122 for me, every single time. All right, so this is why we're gonna think that things aren't working because our, our brain hasn't had time to reconstruct. It, well, it hasn't had time to put in the new construction. Now I know for me, new neural pathways are gonna probably be 122 days. Now, like hopefully, you know, maybe, maybe like, you know how Yahshua wandered in the desert for 40 days, right? Because he was clearing out old limiting beliefs and taking on the spiritual truth of who he was. He did it in 40 days, and this is very significant. And throughout the Bible, the number 40 is very powerful. So you could go into this with that, that thought, how powerful the number 40 is. And you're just going to go ahead and do this in 40 days, right? Okay, but our brain does need time to create new construction. So think about that. Like, I know, like when I've gone to work out, and it feels good to say this while the guys are not here, right? Our, our team of, of personal trainers and stuff, they're, they're off today, but... I'll be like, I worked out three times last week. It didn't do anything. <laughs> That's how I feel, <laughs> right? And, and yet I know, like, Taylor will be like, yeah, you got to do this for a few months, and you need to, like, three times a week. I'm like, really? Once a week doesn't do it? <laughs> That's not what I want to hear, because I don't have the new construction done yet, right? It's just about construction. So if we're thinking, well, I prayed about this, and, and nothing happened, I did all the stretching and I still have all my pain. Nothing happened, nothing changed. Well, it's because we really have to dig in with this commitment. We really gotta dig in with the belief about God being all things and that we're working from that. So that's how we're creating the tipping point in here so that we can be part of the movement out here. And it may take us um, 66 to 122 days to do this. I remember when I stopped calling God, God, and started calling it spirit. And then that felt really weird for a few months. And then it was like the universe. And then that felt weird for a few months. And then I was like, uh, source. And then that felt weird. I was just trying them all on, right? I was trying them all on. Light, love, the cosmos, the force, right? I tried all of those out. And now I'm just like back to God again. But now, now they all feel fine. Now they all feel fine. And I, I talk about God or the universe probably the most. But I did it. I made the shift. It felt really, really weird. And then one day it didn't. Okay? So we just have to stick with it. We just stick with something. But it does help if we can have some really deep understanding about this one thing. And this one thing is the truth about divine substance. You know how we talk about God as all things, right? Everywhere that's, that's everything that's ever been everywhere. Um, Divine substance is a field of pure potential that we live in. And quantum physicists now call this field because they're studying the space in between all the atoms and molecules and nucleuses. They're studying the space in between that. And the scientists are saying, well, there's something happening there and there's nothing there, but there's something happening there. Okay, that's the field. Now, when uni the unity movement happened back in the late 1800s, they weren't like, oh, the field. I just reached into the field of pure potential. You know, they were like the divine mind. That's what they said, the divine mind. That's in divine mind. Okay, but think about this. Every creation story you've ever heard, like, okay, of course, Genesis is the most popular creation story we know about here, but the creation story, there was a conversation between these divine beings and in the earlier translations of the book of Genesis, where you hear, we'll create man in our image, right? There's a conversation between divine beings. In the story of Brahma and Maya in the creation of the world, 
There's nothing, but there's a conversation between these two divine beings. And then what happens is there's nothing, and then all of a sudden there's everything. This field of nothing, where everything came from, it was that nothing that was the field of pure potential. It was just waiting for direction. It was waiting for direction. So in the Genesis story, Elohim said, let there be light, and there was light. Okay, in the Hindu creation story, Maya basically said, let the games begin. <laughs> let the games begin. Now in the book of John, John writes, first off, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and God was the word, and there was nothing, nothing ever created that didn't come from God. So that's kind of interesting, because like nothing was all created from God, but like there was nothing that didn't come from God. Okay, so yeah. Anyway, that's why we acknowledge, that's why it's our first principle here at Unity. God is all things. God's everything that's ever been, everything that's yet to be. God is the allness. And God is abundance. This is why it is, it is divine for us to be calling forth abundance because abundance, God is abundance because look, stuff keeps getting created. It didn't tap out 600 years ago. There's continually new things being created in our world. There are new medicines being discovered, new supplements being discovered. There are new songs being written, new stories being told, new art being created. And I mean, how many paintings can you create before you start repeating paintings? We don't know. Like we don't, we just don't know. It's infinite. What is coming from this source, this divine substance, this field of pure potential, the field, what is coming from there is infinite. And each of us are calling forth a part of that. It's coming through us. That's how it gets into this world. Stuff's not just dropping out of the ethers. Right? There's not a new painting that just lands out there on the grass. Right? Here's your new art. Okay, it's all coming through us. In the book of Acts, the Apostle Paul says, The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by man, nor is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to man life and breath and everything. He is not far from each of us, for in him we live and move and we have our being. We live and we move and we have our being in the field of pure potential. We live and we move and we have our being in the ocean that is God. Okay, the ocean that is infinite that is God. Ernest Holmes, the founder of the Church of uh, Religious Science, he talks about grace, the power of grace, is the givingness of spirit to its creations. Everything that we could need, it's available to us. Okay, that's God giving life and breath and everything. And everything. That's everything. Right? And so it is giving itself to us. It's not doing something and we have to get its attention. Hello? Hello? I'm over here. I'm ready to write a story. It's already waiting. It's already has the, it's already impelled to work through us. We've already, we received the inspiration to write a story. Where do we think the inspiration come from? Came from. It came from source. It came from God. That's why we get this idea in the first place. But then it keeps giving to us because along with any inspiration we receive from God, we're also being given the means to create that thing. Even Paul, I don't remember where he said it, but Paul says, where do you think these good ideas come from that you have? <laughs> That's what he says. Where do you think these good ideas come from? Okay, so we live and we move in this substance of God, this creative substance, just as a fish lives in water. I heard this is, a, this is one of my favorite little cute fish stories. It's super short. There's this older wise fish. He's swimming along. And there are these two little fish, right? Two youngsters. They're like Generation Z fish, okay? They, they know everything, right? And so the older fish is swimming along, and he sees these two young fish, and he goes, Hey, fellas, how's the water? And he keeps swimming, and the other fish are like, What's water? What's water? But we do the exact same thing when we're living in the conditions of our life. 
when we're looking out here and thinking, oh, this is not working, and I don't like this, and this has to change so that I can be happy and life can be easy for me. We are swimming in the sea of unseen forces, but we're focusing on lack, so we're not going to notice. We're not going to realize. It's like, oh, it wants to work through me, but I'm really busy focusing on this. The one little thing out here I don't like. So we live and we move and we have our being in these divine creative forces, and it is giving itself to us. The substance responds to us the moment we have our let there be light moment. Or maybe you have the let the games begin moment. I don't know. But the moment you have that moment, it moves into action. But see, without awareness, without that awareness, it's there. But it's like, we're just like, what's water? We're not doing anything with it. We don't realize it's available to us. We don't realize it's giving itself to us already. Anything that we could possibly need, a universe of resourcefulness working through us, and then a world of resources available for us, we're not going to have a clue. Okay, not if we're not in the right awareness. So anything you could ever need through infinity and beyond, it's available to you. You just have to allow it. So to become a tipping point, this, this, we want to think on this like through the day because the more we think on it, the more not crazy it sounds and the more normal it becomes for us. And that there's this, the truth about substance is that it is divine energy waiting for us to do something with it. It's just waiting. So we think on, okay, God is everywhere. God's everything that's ever been and everything that's yet to be. And that means me and my ideas. Can we just go there? Because the substance is already ready to work through you anything that you can imagine. I just can't say that enough. It's ready to work through you right now, anything you can imagine, but you need to give it direction. And that direction is your creative idea, the next experience you want to have, the next thing that you want to do to call forth a little more good into your life. You are a center of divine activity. That's why the space where you stand is holy ground, because you are the holy ground. You are the container for spirit. The, I like to, this is how I visualize it. Like, we're the activity of God. Okay, and so, to me, I feel like the heart is a doorway. And if you can open the heart up, and I've done this in meditation, you open the door to the heart, and you dive in, and you go into the dimension of heaven. You go into the dimension of spirit, or the unseen world, or the cosmos. You can go anywhere you want. But why do you think we just feel so much through here? Right? And, and if we have a great meditative experience, we feel so much radiating through here. Or when we receive that gift of grace, we feel it all through here. So I truly believe that every heart is a doorway. And that's where we're calling forth all this good. Even receiving an inspiration or an idea that feels so amazing, you don't just feel that in your head. It, it, it kind of envelops your whole body. Okay, so the space where you stand is holy ground because of that. All of this abundance in the field of pure potential is available to you wherever you are. You don't have to do anything special to get it other than be aware of it. So our call to action this week, right? I found this affirmation and I'm just loving it. It's, it's, I kind of, it's, it's a little twist of Eric Butterworth here. But here's our affirmation. My fortune begins with me. Okay, let's say that. My, My fortune, fortune begins, begins with, with me. me. So here's what Eric Butterworth said, a unity mystic, in his book, The Spiritual Economics. He says, your fortune begins with you. Your fortune begins with you. It's an important moment in your life when you discover for yourself the great truth that things may happen around you and things may happen to you but the only things which really count are the things that happen in you, in you. The things that happen in us, they happen when we step into our divine authority. Right, how does that sound? Can I step into my divine authority on that? Really all that is, all that is is just remembering God is all things and that means me and I am here to do the good work that's what I'm here for. That's my charge. And I just call forth that substance. 
giving it direction, that's on me. Nobody out there is gonna do the work for me. Nobody out there can make me suddenly feel faith, feel creative, be inspired. That's all coming from me, that's on me. That's what creates the tipping point. And that's what helps us to start creating a new habit. It used to be weird to me to walk around and say, God is all things, and that means me. I, would, I, would, I actually had a, the physical action. God is all things, and that means me. Let's do, all, let's do that. God is all things, is all and things. that means that's me. me. That means me. That's called neurobics. Neurobics. It's a neural brain thing, but you do a physical action with it that feels a little weird, and you change the programming in your brain. God is all things, and that means me. So just do it till it doesn't feel weird anymore. <laughs> okay? But we are actually, we're changing the wiring in our brain as we continue to think about these principles. So the thing is, is when we're changing that wiring, remember, we're going to be doing things, it's going to seem hard to do some of these things because what we're sacrificing is our judgments, our limitations, our excuses, our justifications. We're sacrificing those to step out of our comfort zone and, and act on whatever it was that we were just inspired on. And that's, that's going to feel weird. Okay? So even doing this, God is all things and that means me. We have to sacrifice our feeling of thinking, well, people will think I'm a weirdo. And not everybody is ready to do that. So see, if the sacrifices don't have to be huge, but sometimes what we're doing is we're sacrificing a way of thinking. And we keep doing that. We, we, stay, we stay in faith. It's our faith that helps us to keep being committed to things that feel hard or feel weird. It's like we want to do them, but I just, I just want to be there. I don't want to have to get there. Like most of us can say that about things. I want to be there, but I don't want to get there. I want to be in Australia. Well, I don't want to anymore, but I wouldn't want to fly there. Okay, yeah, I am never, I'm not going to Australia. <laughs> okay, so we do all this in faith. Big faith gives us this big life. And, and big faith, I'll just say all faith is big faith. Remember, faith the size of a mustard seed can move a mountain or can get a pepper tree to get up and go into the sea and plant itself. <laughs> right? I think it's a pepper tree. So... Any size faith is big faith because all faith is transformative. All faith is transformative. It helps us expand our territory. It helps us expand our consciousness. Ernest Holmes said, in spiritual terminology, faith means the belief in an unseen presence that directly and specifically responds to us. So that's faith as we believe in this. We know this and we know it responds to us. It just may feel weird thinking about that now. So this, this truth about divine substance, okay, that God is everywhere present, it also has infinite expressions. You are one of those expressions. Your ideas are another one of those expressions. The solutions that you receive for the obstacles in your life, those solutions are another expression of this field of pure potential. Everything comes from this field, everything. And this unseen substance wants to work through each and every one of us. It's just waiting on it, on direction. Just waiting. Like your car is waiting. It's not going to tell you where to drive. Your oven is waiting. It's not going to tell you what to bake. Okay, your TV is waiting. It's not going to tell you what to watch. <laughs> okay, we, have, we step into our spiritual authority and we take responsibility. I mean, I'm not going to go home today and say, TV! Why aren't you showing me something? I'll take responsibility for what I'm going to watch when I'm in my daytime jammies. In 45 minutes. Okay, so we give it, we give this unseen force direction. We give it direction. And the ideas that we're receiving, even though they may not seem like great ideas or world-changing ideas, maybe some of the ideas are things like, oh, I'm going to put my books in alphabetical order. Hmm, I think I'll donate some books. They don't have to be like, well, I can't figure out how to do world peace, so forget it. Not going to even try. Can't remember what the affirmation for today's daily word was like, 
something like I am a centerpiece, and it's us doing the work here, and then we send it out there, and this is how we're creating heaven on earth. So until next time, remember, you are the activity of God walking around in physical expression, here to call forth the good, and everything you do, you are blessed, and so it is.